week on Perspective, two presidents, Venezuela's struggle for democracy. Venezuela once boasted the richest economy in Latin America, affluence built on oil. It said Venezuela has the largest proven oil reserves in the world. And not that long ago, the country was held up as an example of stability and democracy and economic success. All that wealth does little for the people of Venezuela today. The tens of thousands who've marched in the streets in recent weeks seek to reclaim a country whose economy has imploded and whose political future is uncertain. Hyperinflation is beyond belief, predicted to hit one million percent. Food and medicine, what little there is, priced beyond reach. Crime is rampant. Human rights groups have documented what they describe as widespread and systematic use of excessive force and arbitrary detention. Some three million Venezuelans have been forced to flee the country, creating a refugee crisis that is fast becoming one of the world's most critical humanitarian disasters. Presiding over this disaster is Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro, a strong man clinging to power in the wake of an election widely seen as illegitimate. Propped up by Cuba, Russia and China, discredited and under pressure to step down from neighboring countries in Latin America and others, including Canada and the U.S. Soy Nicolas Maduro. Online and in speeches, Maduro has lashed out, suggesting the U.S. is only after his country's oil and warning against any outside military intervention. No permitamos un Vietnam en América Latina. Quieren ponerle la mano a nuestro petróleo, como hicieron en Irak, como hicieron en Libia. With power in the streets and political and financial backing from the U.S. and Canada, among others, Juan Guaido, who leads the country's elected National Assembly, has declared himself interim president of the country. No es el momento del miedo. No es el momento de echar para atrás. No es el momento de respetar al pueblo de Venezuela. This is not the time to fear, Guaido says, nor the time to walk back. He was addressing the Venezuelan military directly in those remarks, but the message to his country is the same. On Monday, Canada hosts a meeting of the Lima Group, a group of more than a dozen countries, including Canada, that was formed to try to deal with the crisis in Venezuela. On the program this week, we'll look at the refugee crisis prompted by the dire situation in Venezuela and what role Canada might play. We'll also speak to an expert on Latin American affairs about the broader implications of Venezuela's troubles. But we begin in Caracas with Ana Vanessa Herrero, a reporter for The New York Times. First, how would you describe the atmosphere in Caracas now? I, I, I don't think there's a word to describe the atmosphere here. I, I think it's so complicated what is happening. Um, while we have a government saying there is a queuing process, then we don't see any actions taken by the government to prevent this. Um, and on the other side, there is this group opposition with an interim president um, starting making decisions, taking action, going to the streets, and with the people's support and with international community support. And uh, then, again, every you see every Venezuelan trying to live their normal, if that's a possible in Venezuela, lives. I mean, they're trying to go to the supermarket. They're struggling with the same things. They're struggling with hyperinflation, which is projected, by the way, uh, up to um, 10 million percent this year. They're struggling with um, minimum wage, so that it's about $6, $5 a month, a month, with prices changing every single day with the the incapacity of finding medicines and finding food of um feeding their families. And of course, we also find those people that are just leaving the country. They're fleeing this uh, madness and the conflict in, in Venezuela. So the mood, it's, it's so it's so strange. It's a mix of so many things of um, sadness, um, hope. Uh, I've seen a lot of hope lately. That's something I haven't seen in a while. Mm. That, that's different, for example, from before. Is that what has in some ways motivated people in, to go into the streets? Can, tell me a little bit about the people who are at those protests. 
Well, um, the protests that started uh, the middle of January, they, they started differently than the protests we saw, for example, in 2014 and 2017. Um, we are talking about people from the slums, people from poor neighborhoods uh, who used to be, or at least that's what the government tried to sell, the idea that they used to be the ones who supported Hugo Chavez, who supported Nicolás Maduro. Those were the ones who started taking the streets overnight. They started um, clashing with uh, the special forces unit. They, they started clashing with the police. Um, they were the ones uh, asking for a change. And then the middle class, or uh, lower middle class followed uh, once the opposition tried to control the agenda. That is completely different than the past. That is absolutely different than before. And these people right now are, are, are following whatever the opposition is, is trying to do. The, the opposition is, for the first time also, they are doing the right steps. They're taking the right steps towards what they want to accomplish. They now know that they are supported by international community. They don't feel the need to go to a dialogue table anymore. They don't feel the need to uh, attend when the government says, OK, let's sit down and negotiate. Now they know they have people, they have the international community, and they have the power. They are the ones um, writing the agenda. The government's just following it. And that is, that is very different than before. And this, this is something that started, as I was telling you, with lower middle class and poor, class, and, and poor neighborhoods going to the streets and, and the slums uh, finally awaking and, and asking for a change. So uh, even as we speak, which is Thursday afternoon, uh, the special action force, which is not the military, but s almost a, a, a specialized Maduro force in some way, mm -hmm. has gone to the home of the opposition leader, Guaido. Yeah. What should we make of that, do you think? It's, it's just uh, a mechanism of pressure uh, that the government wants to put on Juan Guaido. They know. Uh, that and they're ve they're being very careful right now with every step and decision they're taking. I'm talking about the government. They are being so careful, so cautious about how they uh, proceed towards uh, and, and how they attack in sort of way the opposition and the opposition leaders. Um, they can do and they know they can do it like before. They can just go into their houses, take him away in the middle of the night. Uh, throw him into jail, and then a year, two years later, start a trial. That's what they did before. Right now, they're following um, the rules. They're following the the book, as as the book says. They open an investigation. That's what the attorney general said. They asked the Supreme Court to act. The Supreme Court um, took actions, and uh, they froze their assets and their uh, why those assets and uh, the accounts. Uh, he can leave the country now. Uh, and now they are pushing. I think if you see it like this, Nicolás Maduro started asking for a dialogue. Maybe this is a way of pushing um, Juan Guaido to accept that dialogue. They, I mean, everyone knows here how the government acts. And um, it's, it's not a nice way. And no one really wants the government as an enemy. And maybe this way, the government thinks he's going to be more, um, uh, he's going to be al allowing this, this uh, conversation to happen. But he's been really um, determined. He said that they were trying to break his family. They couldn't. That the neighbors around uh, his house um, tried to, uh, um, to block the way, uh, the entrance of, of the building. I mean, he has support, and he knows it. And, and Juan Guaido knows this. And then he's, he's acting like he has everything you know, to win for. We haven't touched yet really on the military itself. Tell me right. what you're watching for now over the next few critical days. We don't really know what to expect uh, from the military. Um, a lot of experts on this subject thought that after seeing tens and hundreds of thousands of people on the streets, um, you know, raising their hands, being thrown in with Juan Guaido, and after they saw the international support, then quickly the, the, the military would start um, reacting and, and supporting the opposition. But this hasn't happened yet. 
And this is a very slow situation. It's not happening like most people thought it would. Um, it's taking their time. The military, although the, milita the, the high ranks uh, supported Nicolás Maduro, the opposition says that they are not aiming for the high ranks who are usually, or, or according to the United States and, and, and other countries that have um, accused them of being involved in illegal acts, in uh, criminal acts, uh, they're not aiming for that. They're aiming for the troops. They're going for the day-to-day -day, um, soldier that suffers the same things as any other Venezuelans, that suffer the uh, shortages of medicine, of food, that can't afford to buy medicines, that, you know, want to leave this country to look for better um, options. So. They, they are they are doing they are very being very specific about what to offer. They've offered um, amnesty. They keep doing that every single time they talk. They talk to the military because they know that it's the last part they need to finally win this. I don't know how to say I don't know how to say it. I mean, maybe a, this game or this political um, madness we're living in. What do you worry about, Anna? Um, <laughs> that is such a profound and tough question. I don't really know what to answer there. I'm worried about, I'm worried about uh, that first that the government is not, is, the government doesn't want to um, leave the, the power they've had over the past 20 years that easily, and that this conflict might escalate uh, into something we don't really even know yet. And I am also worried about the fact that because of the feeling that the desperation of every Venezuelan that wants just a change, that wants to get rid of Nicolás Maduro and of 20 years of uh, um, what they call, their opposition says, it's oppression and, 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 and a dictatorship, according to them. Um, because of that desperation, we are not really, and, and people are not really sitting down to uh, evaluate the consequences of the international support. What's next? How are they going to manage? What's in for the other governments? Are they negotiating? Are they not negotiating? That is not a question. This, those are not questions that are on the table right now for any Venezuelan. They are just living a day at a time because of, of the, the, the situation itself. It's so um, complicated that they have to live and the political situation has to be uh, taken care of one day at a time. But I'm worried that we're not looking a little bit into the future. And even, even the politicians are not looking a little bit into the future. And that maybe this can, you know, backfire at any time. Mm. Anna, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you so much for having me.